Hi everyone! Uh, happy New Week! Happy New Week, I don't know if that's a thing, but we are back today for another Broadway music session. I am your host, Geraldine Anello, and today I'm here with David Andrews Rogers, best known as Dar. Hi David, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm good. So everyone, if you're watching live, I'm not going to tell you yet where David Dar is calling us from. I want you guys to kind of guess it, so I'm going to give you one hint, one hint for now. It is 7 a.m. where he is. So the game we're going to play during a little bit of this interview is where is Dar currently located? Um, and it is 7 a.m. where he is. Also, if you have questions from Dar for Dar, please put them in the comments. Make sure you give us authorization so we can see it. Um, if you don't know Dar, Dar is a music director extraordinaire who has uh, performed all over the world pretty much, right? Like all continents, is that right? Most, yeah. Well, what continents have you performed in? Oh gosh! Well, Asia. I mean, Asia a lot in Asia lately, especially. Um, not as many continents as countries, but but they um, lots in North America, lots in Asia. I did um, the Wizard of Oz in Paris in French. Uh, we also did it in in uh, Brussels uh, and in Antwerp. Um, just you know, I've been really lucky. I've I've sort of played all over. That's really, really cool. So some of the shows, uh, for you guys who don't know Dar, some of the shows he's done on tour include uh, Fiddler on the Roof, Les Miserables, Showboat, Cats, Chicago, An American in Paris, and like he mentioned, Wizard of Oz. Again, for those of you who are joining us, we're playing a game, where is Dar currently? We will give the answer yes, but a little hint to him right now, it is 7 a.m. Yes, he woke up just for us. Um, so I want to talk about this Wizard of Oz in France because the French people don't know about Oz. It was pretty amazing, actually. It was the Andrew Lloyd Webber version of The Wizard of Oz. So it's the one that he did on the West End, and then it played in Canada for a long time. And then we did a North American tour of it. And at the end of the uh, big equity tour of, of Wizard of Oz, um, they decided they wanted to take it to Paris. And so we played Palais de Congress in Paris. We did all the rehearsals in Antwerp, and then we, um, it was the greatest adventure of my life. I mean, I spent Christmas and New Year's in Paris. I know you've done that before. I just uh, but, did it this year. For, yeah, but for a, uh, for a, you know, I, I always say the title of my autobiography will be Not Bad for a Kid from Texas. No. Um, <laughs> I never dreamed that I would be in Paris doing The Wizard of Oz in French. I, it was, I had the time of my life. But did, did the audiences get it? I mean, I get to say that because I'm French. Like, we've never heard of Oz. Oz here, it's like a whole, it's a whole thing. Yeah, but you say that, but we had children coming dressed up as the characters. We had, you know, the producers actually told us that the show was in French, but Over the Rainbow was in English. Oh. Because they said every French uh, singer worth their salt has recorded this, but they've all recorded it in English. That's so true. So the rest of the show was in French, except for Over the Rainbow. What an interesting choice. What did you say? It was just such a great experience. And they, they came out in droves for the show. It was great. And then we went on and played uh, Brussels, uh, and they loved it there, too. We played an arena in Brussels, and, and you know you had thousands of people packed in, eating popcorn and hot dogs, watching this Broadway musical. It was fantastic. Everyone, if you're joining us, remember, we're uh, taking bets on where do you think Dar currently is. Uh, hint. It's currently 7 a.m. where he is. Put in your answers in the comments along with questions. You have one. We're going to ask one question. He's going to give one answer, and then I'm going to provide the answer. So please put in your guess. Where is Dar? It's 7 a.m. where he is right now. We have a question right now from Brayden who wants to know, have the majority of your shows abroad been in native languages or in English? And have there been any noticeable issues when it comes to language barriers, translations with the scripts, et cetera? What a fantastic question. Well. I'm doing The Phantom of the Opera now. And- Don't say where. <laughs> I won't say where, but we're doing it in English and the people who are watching it are not all native English speakers, we'll say that. Uh, we've just, we've already played, with this tour, we've already played Manila, and we've already played Dubai and uh, Singapore and Kuala Lumpur and Tel Aviv, lots of wonderful places. And they have super titles that are being projected uh, to the side and, and below the stage uh, with all the text. What you forget about is 
jokes require timing. And even though we don't think about it as such, the Phantom of the Opera has a lot of moments of, of great humor. Uh, that's part of what offsets the, the darkness of the show. Um, but if people are watching the show, but also having to read the translation in their own language, they don't usually laugh. But if they do laugh, they don't really laugh at the right place. So it's sort of a delayed reaction. Um, other than that, we've had no problems at all. So many of our audiences uh, get swept up in the story itself, uh, being told visually and scenically and musically. So even if they're not reading every word of the translation, uh, I think they're getting swept up with the music and they, they know what's going on. And we have a winner here. Yes, somebody, we cannot see your name, but Facebook user <laughs> said uh, that you are currently in Seoul, Korea, and also they love you, whoever oh, they are. <laughs> you all love them. I love them too. <laughs> uh, yes, Seoul, South Korea, and I've got to tell you, uh, it, is, it is a dream to be here. The people of South Korea have been amazing to us. The government of South Korea is extraordinary. Uh, I know we don't like to talk about the dark times, but but South Korea has it going on. They are in such good shape. Um, and it's my understanding that uh, we're the only big show running on the planet. right? So the way I like to think about this, you guys, is that Dar is the only current music director who is working, which really deserves its own applause because I think it's, it should give us hope because we're all looking at the future, hoping theater will come back. But we have to remember, theater is currently happening. It's happening in Seoul, Korea, and it's happening with DAR. And I think that's amazing. And that's why we're wearing our blacks, to celebrate the fact that performances are happening. How are they happening? What Maybe you're living like our future. Well, they're happening with such beautiful control and such beautiful respect for everybody's health and well-being and the producers, the presenters here have been magnificent about the way they've taken care of our company, but they're also taking such great care of their audiences. They understand that their audiences are just as much family as all of us who are doing the show are. And so there are all sorts of protocols in place. And, you know, I don't want to get into all that because it's it's well technical and everything. But the, the fact remains, it can be done. It is being done. And just yesterday in the Daily Mail in London, um, our our sort of supreme boss, Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, was quoted as saying, not only are we the only real show that's the big show that's currently on the boards, um, but we are showing that it can be done. We are showing that there is a future. We are showing that audiences want, and I would dare say need uh, us, that there are all these reports going all around online about, you know, all those who you think that the arts are not that important. Remember that during these times, everybody has turned to the arts to get them through. Just as we have in all challenging times in our lives, we rely on music and theater and dance uh, and all those beautiful artistic expressions to um, to get through. And, and those people become our families just as much as, as our families do. And in person is of course always best. Uh, so people will fight for ways to get back into the theater. We just have to be creative in the solutions. And I know before we went live, you were telling me about the audiences in Seoul. Oh gosh, they're, they're so joyful. They're so, um, I also think that, that what we're giving them is, is an escape like theater and music have always done. Uh, we, we give them a, a way for two and a half hours to not think about what's going on in the world, not think about what's going on in their daily lives, but to get caught up in the romance and the intrigue and the beauty and the joy and the passion uh, that is the Phantom of the Opera and has always been the Phantom of the Opera. And it's even more uh, needed right now for all of us and for us too in the company. This is, this is what's getting us through every day too, knowing that we can get out there and share something of ourselves, something of our hearts, something of our passion with, uh, with our beautiful, beautiful audiences. So everyone, there is still hope. And uh, if you have questions for Dar, uh, put them in the comments. Don't hesitate and I'll ask them for you. Now, something I personally love about your career, Dar, are all the live concerts you've done for Pops Orchestras, because that's something I think is so cool that I know I would love to do at some point. And you even got to do it for the New York Pops at Carnegie Hall. 
No, I want to hear all about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a, there was once a really wonderful gentleman called Barry Levitt that some people may know, and if you don't know him, uh, you should because he was quite a force in the New York music scene. Uh, he was primarily a jazzer, but he was very um, key in the New York cabaret scene. And I had conducted the uh, the Broadway National Tour of Chicago for a while, and there was a concert coming up that was a tribute to John Kander and Fred Ebb, and. Uh, out of the blue one day, Barry called me and said, hey, you know this Chicago music, why don't, why don't you come help me out with this, this little show I'm doing? And I said, sure, you know, when is it? And he told me the date and I said, yeah, I think I could do that. He said, no, it's not, there's not much rehearsal, there's a rehearsal in the afternoon and then we do, we do the show twice and, and that's it. And I said, oh, that's fine. And he said, now it's a, it's a you know, big gala benefit. So there's not a lot of money involved. And I said, well, you know, the chance to work with you is great. So I'm happy to do it. Now, all that before he had really told me the, the key ingredient of all this. And, and I said, that'd be great, let's do it. And he said, great, so uh, you'll need to be at the hall at about X time on such and such date and I'll, I'll send the scores over to you uh, for, uh, for you to mark up and, and look at. I said, great, um, what hall? And he said, <laughs> oh, you know, with the New York Pops. Well, come on. <laughs> I was, my mind was completely blown. Uh, it, the evening was so exciting. It was, um, I, I'll never forget my first downbeat at Carnegie Hall. Skitch Henderson was still alive. He introduced me to, to the musicians. Um, we got to run, you know, my charts down. I got to write a couple of charts. I wrote a sort of a Sinatra swing chart of maybe this time that, um, that they just, you know, when you're writing for the pops, they can play anything. So you write from your heart, you don't have to edit. And, uh, and it was just, it was truly one of the most extraordinary experiences in my life and taught me so much about uh, writing and working with musicians and working with, with real pros at the top, top, top of their game. And then I got to do it a couple more times after that. The, my last time at Carnegie Hall was 2008 and I remember it like it was yesterday. What sorts of things did you learn? Um, communication, confidence, respect, listening to the musicians. Uh, I, was, I was taught early on and I, I took as, a, as a, um, a goal early on to learn something every day. Learn, learn, learn. I think that's the key to life. I've got a 92 year old father who still spends every day learning something new. Uh, but with the pops uh, on our first break, one of the first things that I did was take a couple of the musicians uh, aside and say, so this is a blast. I'm having a ball. Tell me what I can do better. Ooh. Tell me what I can do that will will help more, that, you know? and. I think they were a little surprised. You know, uh, the, we say that, that ha being a conductor is all about uh, having confidence and being in control and, you know, having a big ego and all that. Well, I think, I think the smartest thing to do is, is listen to the people around you who are, uh, who are in the trenches, who are doing it. Um, somebody said, asked me lately who my, um, who my teachers have been. And really, I, my master teachers are every single musician I've ever worked with, every single singer I've ever worked with, every single uh, shoot, actor, director, choreographer, stage manager, audience member. You have to listen to those people and you have to learn something from them. Um, I, I, would, I would give a, a downbeat at Carnegie Hall or at, you know, at a dinner theater, you know, it doesn't matter. It's the work, it's the joy, it's the, it's the experience of making music together. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that uh, if you're open to learning as well as open to teaching, then uh, you've kind of found one of the secrets to life. It's that servant leadership spirit. That's, that's exactly it. It's servant leader. It's, it's uh, when I stand in front of an orchestra, whether it's the New York Pops or our beautiful, beautiful orchestra here in Seoul, South Korea, or truly anywhere else. I spent 12 years uh, conducting for uh, the pop star Debbie Gibson uh, and with rock bands. The first thing you have to think about when you get in front of those musicians is what can I do to help? 
And the and and uh, we have a few questions coming in that I'm going to be asking. But the million dollar question is: so you ask your musicians at Carnegie Hall what you could do better. What did they say? Well, you know that's the secret, isn't? It? You have to ask. <laughs> them. Um, yeah, you know they, they told me some practical things. They told me some specific things. They, um, but the fact of the matter is, they they shared, and and I listened, and I hope that I took their their advice to heart. Um, and and maybe the next musician I asked gave me the exact opposite answer, uh, but they were both right, um, and it's, and it's valid to hear from all of them, and it's. As much as it's valid to hear from all of them, it's it's important for them to know that you care what they think, mm -hmm. and and that you honestly want to know how you can serve them and help help them help you serve the music. Because after all, that's what it's about. It's it's not about um, me or them or you know anybody else. It's about us creating something together. And I think that that's the joy of, of getting to do what we do. I agree. We have a few specific questions about yeah. your experience at, with Phantom of the Opera in Seoul, where you are right now. Yeah. Uh, Kevin wants to know, are all of your musicians local to South Korea? Great question. I travel with an extraordinary team. Our company is very international. Uh, I've often called it the Benetton ad of, of Broadway musicals. Um, it's our cast is from all over the world, literally. Uh, our, our Phantom is South African, our Christine is Australian, uh, our, our Pianji and our Carlotta are both South African. We've got English people and American people and Korean people and, and it's just, the cast is so multinational and so is the orchestra. I travel with a team made up of my glorious associate conductor, uh, Masha, who's Russian, she's from Moscow, uh, my two keyboard players are both American, and I treasure both of them, uh, Dominic and Michael. Uh, our concert mistress is Che Young, who's who's Korean, although she's played in the Broadway pit a lot too. And and then the rest of our orchestra are all local to here in Korea, and they are absolutely glorious. They are members of our family, and I respect and treasure, and and um, I'm just thrilled to meet them every night in the pit. Mark wants to know, did you have to make any edits to the Korean version? Uh, didn't have to make any edits. Um, we did have to coordinate with the, with the local team to get the translations to line up with the show. So there was a bit of rehearsal for that. And then in terms of rehearsal, um, my rehearsal time, I, I'm incredibly lucky. This show is, as you probably know, very complex and very detailed and, and really one of the greatest musical theater scores ever written. Uh, there's a reason it's been running for 32 years. Um, and the fact is, um, it takes a lot of rehearsal. So I have a large amount of rehearsal with the local orchestra, but we added an additional three hour session just to allow for translating time. Uh, and I have I've had wonderful translators working with me. A lot of my musicians uh, that are local speak English, but a lot of them don't. And uh, that's been, um, the same with the crew and the same with, with a lot of our support people. And we had to allow a little time early on. Now, we've been running uh, since in Korea since December. Uh, we played Busan before Seoul. And so by now, they, uh, they are right on target with us. Uh, someone wants to know, what is the most interesting translation in the Korean version? Well, I don't speak Korean, so I have no idea. <laughs> That's fair. So let's talk more about Debbie Gibson. I know we have a lot of Debbie Gibson fans in the group. Well, that's a whole other, you know, we call it music directing, but it's a whole other job, isn't it? It really is. It's interesting. Uh, Deb and I met doing a regional production of Chicago, and I absolutely fell in love with her. Her talent, her joy, her passion for the work. Um, I, People who are fans of hers probably know this, but but everybody else has to remember she's the youngest artist in the history of music to ever write, sing, and produce a number one hit song. And that was Foolish Beat when she was 14 years old. Uh, she's written music and lyrics for all of her hit songs, and there have been a bunch. And she's back on the charts right now with a dance uh, tune called Girls' Night Out that's just magnificent. Go check it out. But the fact is we met doing this musical theater piece, Chicago. She was extraordinary. She was fantastic. Uh, she was Velma. And and as as we do with all of our 
you know, friends that become family in, in theater experiences. At the end of the show, we said, you know, we just love each other. We'll, we'll, uh, we should work together again sometime. And, and I, I said, you know, I'd love to work with you anywhere. And she said, great, I'll call you. And then she did. And, and we, we just hit it off. And, and I fell in love with her, her music. Uh, we've done everything from, uh, we did a six week residency at, at Harris in Atlantic city once uh, we did Carnegie Hall together. She was on that Candor Neb benefit. Her Broadway album is called Colored Lights, and she sang Colored Lights from the Rink with the New York Pops, and I got to conduct her doing that. We did a, a huge concert in Singapore many years ago at Fort Canning Park. Um, uh, we really have have intersected in and out of one another's lives so many times. Uh, she also wrote a couple of songs for Cirque Musica, and I wrote the orchestrations for the for those the big full orchestra uh, and two original songs. There's there's nothing quite like sitting in your apartment in New York with, you know, Debbie Gibson sitting at a keyboard writing a song while you're sitting at your desk orchestrating it as she f finishes it, and then knowing that it's going to be played all over the world by Cirque Musica. I mean, she's she's also the kindest, most passionate, gentle wonderful bosses and friends that that I could ever imagine. I treasure her. And you were her music director for 12 years. What were the main responsibilities that you had? Well, the, really, sometimes with her material, the main responsibility is, like with Atlantic City, we took some of her her uh, original pop songs and 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 I added horn charts for them. We we beefed them up a little bit, so the originals were uh, were products of their time. They were they were mainly '80s pop songs, and and so we added a little bit of, of brass and winds to to beef it up a little bit, and some strings. And we did a cruise ship once where we added uh, strings and a string quartet and a harp uh, to her pop songs. And uh, taking what had originally been synthesizer string lines and doing a full string section. But then at the same time, she had just released a Broadway album. And so taking those charts, which were written by uh, wonderful, wonderful orchestrators for big, full pit orchestras, and making them sound a little more pop, uh, we worked together on a lot of those things. So uh, a lot of it, too, is learning how to communicate with pop musicians, uh, which is a little different from working with theater Broadway pit musicians. In what ways? Uh, they're, they sort of speak a different language. You, uh, A lot of it's on the page, but so much with pop is about feel and about uh, mood and about texture and and you give uh, you give them references. Uh, you, you've got to give them a little more freedom. Uh, you know, we're, we all, anybody who's written orchestrations know that that sometimes when you're, uh, when you're pressed with a deadline, you end up writing those slashes for the guitar player or slashes for the drummer. And you have to remember just how much a part of your team and how much a part of the magic the musicians are who take those slashes, who take, you know, a, a rhythm that's written out for two measures and then play the whole song in the same spirit, in the same style. And, um, and that's, a, that's an art unto itself and getting into their heads and hearing how the music is ever so slightly different every night. Whereas in a Broadway pit, what we're really looking for is it to sound pretty much exactly the same every night. Um, and allowing in pop, allowing for that uh, inspiration to inform what everybody's doing. And then as a conductor and music director, coalescing all that and keeping everybody um, involved with the same larger architecture while always, always, always in pop supporting the singer, 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 singer. Uh, there's, there's, she's such a, a treasure in terms of being a singer songwriter that she knows every thing about music that you could ever want to know. But my job as a music director is to translate what's in her head to the musicians so that, so that when she's on stage, she doesn't have to be the writer. She can just be the performer. Well, Dar, thank you so much for waking up. Thank you so much for taking time out of your current production schedule, giving us all hope that if you're doing it right now, we're all going to be doing it again. Uh, so thank and you for waking up. <laughs> I got to say one more thing. Never yes. forget gratitude, 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 gratitude. My mission in life is to make sure everybody realizes that gratitude is fuel. Gratitude is life. 
gratitude is the basis for everything. Um, and, and I don't mean gratitude for the big things. I mean gratitude that we got out of bed this morning. Gratitude that you guys have already spent a beautiful day uh, living your lives and, and hopefully healthy and hopefully joyful and hopefully finding things that inspire you and, and turn you on artistically and creating and living and, and learning and um, being grateful for everything even sometimes the challenging stuff. I love it. And that's coming from the only music director currently working in the world because it is happening. It is happening. Theater is happening every night in Seoul, Phantom of the Opera. Dar, thank you so much for waking up so early, spending time with us. I hope you get to go back to bed after this. Okay. Everyone, thank you for your questions. Thank you for tuning in. We'll, we'll be back tomorrow. Bye, Dar. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.